GBO for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen um, so that you can see my slides. Great. Um, so, uh, as Jay said, uh, I'm a postdoc at the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalusia. I've been trying to work on my Spanish, so uh, I thought I'd give that a go. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about some of the neat work that we've been doing with the GBT, with data from the GBT on the H1 properties of dwarf satellite galaxies within the local volume. Uh, we've submitted this work as a paper to uh, MINRAS, but it's available on the archive uh, if you'd like to check it out as a preprint. Um, there's a team of people that have worked on this uh, on this study, uh, and I want to highlight some of the work that's been done by an undergraduate at the Royal Military College of Canada, Reese Carroll, who got uh, their hands dirty working on some GBT data, doing some data reduction and subsequent analysis. So let's get started. And the first thing that I wanted to provide you with is some background and some motivation. So I'll do that for a few slides. Uh, the first thing to start with is cosmological galaxy formation and evolution. So in the slide here, what you see are two panels. The one on the left shows a 2D slice of the full volume from the Aquarius simulation suite. This is a high resolution, large cosmological volume simulation. And what you see here in the darker regions are areas of low density dark matter and in high uh, in brighter colors in like orange and yellow, you see higher density regions. And what you can see is that there's this large filamentary structure, this large scale structure um, that we expect to see from our simulations because we also see them in our observations as well. So our theory uh, matches our observations quite well in this respect. If we zoom in on one of these over densities, as you can see um, moving from the left to the right panel, uh, we have this central over density or this central dark matter halo. And within it, what you can see are these smaller over densities. Uh, these smaller specks of uh, bright regions. And these subhalos of dark matter um, are gravitationally bound to the central one. Now, what's important here is that within our current framework, within Lambda CDM, uh, we believe that galaxies form in a hierarchical manner. So uh, these smaller central, uh, these smaller subhalos um, form together and merge together in the early universe to form what we expect to see uh, as the central halo here today. And uh, it's the interactions between these subhalos and these central halos uh, that are really important in defining the uh, evolutionary histories of these systems as a whole. Um, if we go ahead and paint some of the faintest dwarf galaxies we know from the local group, um, as well as the central halos, uh, central galaxy as well. Um, here I've chosen Andromeda or M31 as the central halo and a selection of uh, dwarf galaxies uh, from the local group. Now, what we can see from this is that there's a clear diversity in this population. So some of these are very uh, faint and low in mass, uh, while others are much more massive. They have different morphologies, different colors. And all of this really tells us about their evolutionary histories. Um, what's really useful here is not only understanding what we can see visually, but having a broader understanding of their baryonic properties as a whole, as well as the processes that affect them. Because it's these things coupled together that really provide us with these constraints on how our current, um, how well we can fit our current formation and evolutionary theories for galaxies. Now, as I mentioned, these dwarf galaxies in the local group, um, they're, because of their proximity, we can study them uh, to the faintest magnitude. So we see things on the order of 10 to the three solar masses or so. Um, so these are very faint systems. And we can start to play some interesting games, if you want to say, uh, in terms of their environmental effects. So looking at environmental uh, dependencies. So that's what I'm trying to show you with these two well-established trends within the local group. So the figure on the left shows you the ratio of gas and stellar mass or the gas richness of these satellites as a function of their distance from the Milky Way. Um, and what we can see from here is that the red points, which are these Milky Way dwarf spheroidals, are typically gas poor, and they all lie within the immediate gravitational influence of the Milky Way, uh, which is shown as the dotted vertical line. This is the virial radius, or the approximate virial radius of the Milky Way. If you go beyond this distance or beyond this radius, uh, beyond this influence, what you see is that Dwarf galaxies in the local group or in the periphery of the local group are typically gas rich and star forming. If we shift over to the figure on the right, 
What we see on the y-axis is the satellite quiescent fraction with a fraction of non-star forming galaxies uh, as a function of stellar mass. And what we can see from the blue points, which combine the Milky Way and M31 satellites together, uh, is that as you go towards lower and lower stellar masses, the quench fractions become higher and higher. Um, yes, so what we can see taking all this together is that there's a clear distance and mass dependence, especially as we push towards these lower and lower uh, mass regimes. If we shift towards a lower density environment, however, we see that dwarf galaxies can actually thrive. They're typically gas rich, like, it's, like you can see in the figure on the left, which has the fraction of gas as a function of stellar mass once again. Um, and this, the colored points here are from the alfalfa survey. So you can see that relatively speaking, uh, they have reasonable amount of gas uh, in them. The figure on the right shows that these systems are typically star forming because we see that on the y-axis, again, we have the fraction of quenched galaxies uh, as a function of stellar mass. And the red points here from Gay et al. Uh, show that there's a dearth of star forming systems in isolation. So dwarf galaxies are typically star forming in isolation. I do have an asterisk here, and that's to say that with deeper and deeper optical surveys searching for these systems, we're bound to find some outliers in this respect, and it might be more significant than we expect as well. So with upcoming optical surveys, finding these isolated red systems uh, may contradict some of these findings. So I wanna, I wanna have that caveat there uh, just for now. What we can do as a whole with these improvements in astronomical instrumentation um, and source detection algorithms, novel source detection algorithms, uh, are start to probe systems of satellites beyond the local group and really start to build up our statistics and place some interesting constraints, not only on the local group, uh, but also on hydrodynamical simulations and this sort of cosmological scatter that we expect to see. So some of these systems focus on integrated light, so looking at uh, low surface brightness features uh, around uh, more distant systems, uh, while others focus on resolved stellar counts from deep ground-based imaging combined with uh, space-based imaging to look at the exact CMDs of these systems to better understand uh, their evolutionary histories. What's missing from a lot of these studies, because they're predominantly in the optical, this is how most of these systems are detected, uh, is their other major baryonic con uh, component, which is their their gas, uh, and specifically their H1 gas is what I'm I'm going to focus on for the rest of this talk. So this is the neutral hydrogen gas. I should have also mentioned that. So we focus on the H1 content of satellites in the local volume, as I mentioned in my introductory slide, um, and we selected our sample from a local volume optical catalog uh, that was put together by Carlson et al. Um, using some optical imaging from the Canada, France, Hawaii telescope uh, imaging. So we selected this sample to have a, a minimum uh, absolute V-band magnitude of minus 9.5. So all of these systems are brighter than that limit uh, for a total sample of 66 satellites. 49 of them, we conducted deep observations with the GVT for a total of about 72 hours of integration time. Uh, and the remaining 17 had literature H1 measurements. So these are typically brighter sources that were in either alfalfa or existing uh, H1 catalogs. You can see a sample of these satellites uh, in the figure on the right, where we have uh, dwarf regulars on the top, dwarf ellipticals in the middle, and nucleated dwarf ellipticals uh, on the bottom row. What's really useful about this sample is that these systems have distance measurements already or distance estimates already uh, conducted using the surface brightness fluctuation or SBF distance estimation method. Now, this method is typically robust for uh, passive, more smoother uh, elliptical-like systems uh, because you can really tease out the SBF for the surface brightness fluctuations uh, after removing the model of them, of their, of their disks. Um, but what they really start to become more tentative for, these SBF distance estimates, uh, are for more dwarf regular or potentially star forming uh, dwarf systems because they're much more clumpy. It's harder to distinguish their intrinsic SBF from uh, the star forming clumps. And this really came to the forefront in our uh, 
subsequent GBT data analysis and reduction uh, and uh, data reduction analysis. Uh, and the two detections out of the 49 that we observed uh, that we truly associate with the dwarfs themselves are shown on the right. Uh, both of these we've confirmed to be in the backgrounds of their putative hosts. So they're not tentative satellites anymore. They're in fact field dwarf galaxies. And their tentative nature was uh, noted because of their slightly more irregular morphologies, um, but also their uh, slightly bluer color. So it really goes to show that having this spectroscopic confirmation can really turn, um, especially in H1, can really turn something from uh, a tentative, something tentative in nature to something rather concrete. For the remaining 47 systems, we were able to set five sigma upper limits on their H1 derived properties or on their derived H1 properties. Some of these satellites uh, projected so close to their host systems that we in fact uh, were able to detect or we saw that their spectra were obscured by their host H1 emission. Um, so for these systems, we estimated the RMS of the sigma um, in the emission-free regions of their spectrum. I'll now go on to spend a, a couple slides just highlighting some of the key results from this work. And the first one has to do with the fact that these observations are the first to, to our knowledge, uh, to systematically push down the luminosity function, the optical luminosity functions of multiple hosts beyond the local group. Uh, and what we're finding is broad agreement in terms of their uh, H1 properties with the local group, which is a, a good sign so far. Uh, the figure on the right here shows the V-band absolute magnitude on the y-axis as a function of the separation from the respective hosts on the x-axis. The local group sample is shown in green, while the local volume sample, the one from our work, is shown in orange with H1 detections shown as stars and non-detections or upper limit shown as inverted or upside down triangles. Now we're starting to probe this interesting region as I've described in the text on the left between minus 10 and minus 14 in absolute magnitude. Now this region, we can see that there's a mix of both gas rich and gas poor satellites. And this gives us some interesting constraints when we compare to hydrodynamical simulations. Um, the first is that we can start to constrain where the true transition towards predominantly gas-rich systems is, so beyond this transition region. And we constrain that to about 10 to the 7 in solar luminosity, so in the V-band, so about 10 to the 7 or 10 to the 7.5 in solar masses. The second is that this region is really the beginning of where there's a shift between uh, long and short or uh, long and rapid uh, quenching timescales. Uh, so above this region, we see longer timescale processes such as strangulation and star formation. So these more massive, brighter systems uh, can, are within or embedded within larger gravitational potentials. It can hold on to their, their star forming fuel, their H1 gas much, much better. Uh, but as you push towards fainter and fainter magnitudes or lower and lower masses, what you start to see is much more rapid quenching processes uh, such as uh, internal processes like star formation feedback, coupled with uh, external processes like tidal or ram pressure stripping. Uh, so that's another useful constraint that you can start to place some comparisons with uh, hydrodynamical simulation. The next thing that we can do is start to separate gas-rich and gas-poor satellites um, as a function of their photometric properties. So the figure on the right here shows the V-band absolute magnitude on the y-axis once again, but this time they're G minus R optical color on the X axis. Uh, the blue symbols now show their morphologically classified uh, morphologies. Um, so they're visually classified as either late or early type. So blue and red uh, show late and early respectively uh, with the symbol types being the same as before. So H1 detections of stars and upper limits or non-detections as inverted triangles. Now the, the key takeaway, oh, I changed the slide title for some reason. Okay, anyway, the, the key result from this figure that we're starting to see is this preliminary trend um, towards fainter luminosities or fainter magnitudes, where faint red early type dwarfs are not detected in H1. Well, well you know, you may have said, Anantham, this is, this is pretty obvious. You would have expected this. Well, Sure, but we're confirming this for the first time uh, in a significant sample of hosts beyond the local group. So we're starting to build up this sample that we can build uh, 
build some interesting statistical constraints from. Uh, I should note that we're still limited in terms of our sample size, in terms of the pure number of satellites and the pure number of hosts, uh, because we're still within the Poissonian regime where we'll be dominated by uh, low number statistics. So growing the sample and confirming that these trends are true in these other satellite systems uh, is really important to place statistical constraints uh, on this sort of trend. And thankfully, uh, we were awarded some time this semester, so in 2022B, uh, to follow up the exploration of local volume satellites or the ELV survey or the ELV catalog, which supersedes the one that we drew from for the work that I'm talking to you about today. So we'll be able to increase our sample size by a factor of three from about 60 to about 180. So we'll really have uh, some statistical prowess from that respect. We'll also increase our host sample size to uh, about 20 or 24, so a, a couple dozen, which is, again, really important to be able to make some interesting selections uh, and see if there are any host mass dependencies or host property dependencies in addition to sat satellite dependencies as well. The second thing that I just wanted to highlight, it's not the main focus of this work, but it's some interesting follow-up of other satellite systems. Um, and these were drawn from the Satellites Around Galactic Analogs or SAGA survey. Um, so you may have heard of this survey because these satellites are predominantly star forming. So uh, they all have spectroscopic follow-up. You can see one of the uh, samples, uh, you can see one of the satellite systems in the figure on the right from this sample. Uh, so NGC 4454 is at the center of this cutout uh, with the four satellites shown as uh, the blue circle. So all of these are spectroscopically confirmed um, and they all lie within the burial radius of their putative hosts or their, uh, their hosts actually. Uh, and that's shown as the red dashed circle uh, in this figure. So these systems are a bit more distant from uh, the local volume. So they're between 25 and 40 megaparsecs. Um, and they're much brighter accordingly. So the, the sensitivity limits, optically speaking, uh, are a bit shallower. So uh, the satellites that are selected have a different completeness limit. Now, what we can start to do is take advantage of this fact uh, with the VLA because we have some, uh, we don't need as much uh, sensitivity, but we also need some better spatial resolution. The VLA and deconfiguration seem to be the best bet for this follow up. So we're, we're starting observations for this, the GBT uh, proposal this semester and the VLA observations with deconfiguration are actually underway right now. So we're really excited to see what we get from this. And I just wanna close off by saying that uh, characterizing the H1 properties and also the star forming properties, I should say, uh, as, of satellites beyond the local group is really crucial to understand uh, both theirs and their host evolutionary histories to follow up, it's also really useful to put the, the local group in a grander context. So is it normal? Is it abnormal? Should we be using it as the benchmark for other observations, but also for uh, hydrodynamical simulations, which typically treat the local group as something that they should try to replicate? Um, so having this sort of statistical prowess with larger and larger samples of not only optical properties, but total baryonic properties is really important. Uh, just very quickly, our H1 observations that I talked to you about today are starting to push down the luminosity function and probe this interesting gas-rich and gas-poor regime. And we're finding broad uh, agreement with the local group, which is a, a good sign so far, but we do need um, to st the statistics, as I mentioned. And finally, what I want to say is that H1 observations with the GBT are really an efficient tool and a necessary follow-up tool for systems like this. Uh, and this work is just the beginning. So we're really excited to see what we'll get from not only the GBT, but also the, the VLA observations as well. Uh, I wanna thank the GBO staff once again, and Jay for uh, inviting me to talk to you all about this. I'd like to thank you all for showing up and listening, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thanks. Thanks very much for a fascinating talk. Uh, let me remind people to submit their questions using the Q&A box on the lower right. Um, because we're running a bit late, we got started a bit late, I'm going to have to break off now. But Dave Freyer, if you are on, could you be the host? And uh, we were unable to get Jim Jackson's director's report in at the beginning. But Jim, if you're still available, you may want to say a few words at the very end. 
Um, yeah, Jay, I, I, I can help here. Okay, I'll turn it over to you, Dave. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Okay, go, as um, Jay mentioned, go ahead and put your, your questions in on the Q&A and then we can go, go through them. Thanks again for the talk and sorry for starting late. All good. I don't actually see any, oh, we have, okay. Our first brave person put in a question. Apolo and uh, I'm gonna read them off and then you can go ahead and address them. Sure. Uh, apologies if you've answered this. Um, what part of the galaxies is the H1 coming from? Is it specifically where the background quasars are? Uh, so these, this, this H1 emission is coming from the H1 reservoirs of these satellite galaxies. Is that, is that what you meant? Or do you mean of the obscured uh, H1 emission? I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. So if they want to follow up, but thank you. Oh, both. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Um, so the emission is that we detect from the satellites are coming from the satellites themselves, uh, but the obscured spectra, I have an extra slide here just for this question, just in case someone asked. Uh, so what you see here are the, the spectra with the flux densities on the y-axis and the uh, heliocentric velocities on the x-axis. Um, so these are just a sample of six of the several satellites that were affected by their host, so that we deem to be affected. Um, with the solid black lines, the black vertical lines showing where the systemic velocity of the hosts are, with the dashed lines, so you can see it quite clearly here, uh, showing the extent of where we expect the host emission to be or to dominate. So you can see that in some cases, there's very narrow emission, so we can constrain that the satellites don't lie in these regimes, or they have very little emission, um, so they must be non-detections in these regimes, um, but others cover much broader velocity regions. So um, these are all coming from their putative host, um, so their host H1 emission. I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, anybody else have a, oh, I have. Oh, well, we have a comment, uh, an excellent presentation. <laughs> Thank you. I'll go ahead and stop, stop sharing if that's okay. Yeah, hey, go ahead. Does anybody else want to ask additional questions to follow up? Well, I would, I can't do, enter through the chat line, but uh, and oh, think, really? uh, that was a nice talk. I was um, interested to see that you have what you're, you're calling field dwarf galaxies. So do, are there dwarf galaxies just kind of out there isolated in the field or is, are they part of some larger structure? They are isolated. Um, they may be part of large scale filamentary structure mm -hmm. potentially, but when I say field, I mean, they don't have a massive galaxy that are, that's within maybe one to two or more megaparsecs. So they're outside the immediate influence of any massive structure. That's cool. Okay. Um, Jim, did you want to provide an observatory? Update? Yes, I'll, I'll, and I'm sorry to so, apologize for the late start, but I will, I will chime in here because uh, we, we do have a little bit of news. So um, the observatory, the, the Green Bank Telescope was out of uh, service for a little while. We had a, a technical issue and um, I think I can, Oh, I, I can share some of this. So I'm going to share the screen if I if that works. Um, screen three. You guys see that? Yes, we do. Okay. So there's a, a mechanism that turns the uh, the prime focus boom. So this is the uh, the arm that um, carries the prime focus receiver or retracts out of the way when we're using our Gregorian uh, focus and what happened was um, some fabric from the surrounding enclosure, the boot, uh, got caught. Um, and we still don't quite understand how, but we'll, we'll investigate. But the fabric got caught in this ball screw mechanism that moves the boom. And you can kind of see the, the ends of the fabric 
here, if you can see my cursor. All right, so um, that is uh, that was the culprit. And what happened was, is that fabric got kind of sucked into the ball screw. It jammed the mechanism, and the the um, the boom was caught in a neither fully um, extended nor fully retracted position, so we couldn't observe. Um, so we did some heroic um, thought about this and some, some work. We got some rigging equipment, and here's a picture of the rigging. Um, so you can see what we've done was, this is, this is a chain down, I'll show you another view in a minute. We took the load off of that um, ball screw mechanism, which was holding the, the boom in place. And uh, then we were able to open the ball screw uh, housing and look inside um, to see if we could free up that material. So the, here's the, um, the chain hoist that we got. There's kind of a rigging equipment. And we took the weight off, opened it up. And unfortunately, we couldn't see the, the fabric. The fabric was still buried too far deep inside. So this is where um, some ingenuity came into play. One of our trainees, Dylan White, had an idea, and I think a few others had this idea as well later on. Um, we actually used the flamethrower approach. So we took weed burners, heated up the ball screw uh, to pass the melting point of the nylon fabric inside. That plastic material, the nylon material kind of uh, melted. We were able to turn the screw and um, lower the, uh, the boom arm. So all is well, and, I, and I'd, I'd like to show you a picture of what was the culprit? So there's the culprit. That's some of the material that was inside, caught inside, that was later melted and extruded from the screw by backing it up. So we're back into business. Um, the, the boom is retracted. Um, we can use our Gregorian uh, focus receivers in the receiver cabin. Uh, while the, but with the ball screw mechanism remains uh, out of service and until that's uh, either repaired or replaced, we won't be able to move the boom and therefore we can't change receivers, nor can we use the uh, prime focus feeds. But um, we, will, we will be observing and um, with the Gregorian um, uh, receivers. And we're just waiting for the manufacturer to get back to us on when we can get, expect the parts for the, either the replacement or the repair of that ball screw mechanism. So kudos to the, the Telops team and, the, uh, and to Dylan for having this, in, this nice idea. Um, they worked a very difficult problem. And as you can see, the access wasn't very easy to that location. So it was, uh, it was a difficult problem, but we're, we're on the way to repairing and mending it. So um, it, the good news is this happened during uh, summer maintenance. So um, not a lot of open sky observations were affected. There were some, um, nanograv and breakthrough listen observation that were affected. And Tony Minter is working hard with the, the team and we're revising our summer maintenance schedule to try to make up for as much of these, um, many of these observations as were missed. So um, I'm happy to take some questions if there are any on, on that. Dave, do we see any questions in the chat? I do not yet, okay. or in the Q and A. We okay. did have we had a science question come in, but I guess it was okay. Well, you asked the science question. <laughs> it's much more important than mine. I'm done with my report, so uh, but they get it back to the other. They took it away. <laughs> oh well, actually, no. Okay, Are I there... answered them. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I just typed them out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The, the, I'll just well. I think everybody can, so maybe they can't see that. Anyway, a question came in, can, any potential H1 bridges to the central main object observed? And, um, and the answer was, I think it's similar to what Mark asked from a technical perspective. We need to go to higher spatial resolution as well as greater sensitivity. Meerkat may be our best option in this respect, so thank you. So do we have any follow-up questions for our science speaker or for um, the director, Jim? Seeing not right now, um, we'll bring this to a close. And thank you everybody for participating and look forward to seeing you guys back at the next community Zoom event. So have a good day. Great. Thanks everyone. Thank you.